Having said that, let's jump into the first part of that. Uh, I don't need to introduce myself. That's the, the benefit of doing this yourself. Um, so I just wanted to spend maybe 10 minutes giving you a bit of an insight into data and AI in the real world and how this fits into, these, into this data science life cycle I showed before. Um, before we do that, I think it's still worth from time, there's so many AI companies and AI thingies floating around, worth just kind of framing a little bit what artificial intelligence really is, so we don't just call everything out there artificial in intelligence like some, some other people are doing that. Um, so a couple, I think 250 years ago, so there was this famous mechanical Turk, a chess robot that played amazingly well. It was actually beating pretty, pretty sophisticated chess players, and people were guessing what the hell's going on. They were th thinking about sophisticated mechanical, well, artificial intelligence inside. It turns out inside <clears throat> was really some mechanics to actually allow the human who was sitting in there to see via magnets what was going on on the board and control the hands of the of the mechanical Turk. So I think the message from that one, and there, there are also modern examples of that, right? You look at some of the, the systems that are building chip systems that are building, it can only be intelligence, right? But I think the main point is here, there's a bit of a tendency these days that everything that you don't understand, some, you just label that AI and then it's fine. And I think that's fundamentally flawed. There's a lot of extremely complex systems out there that we don't really understand how they work. There are actually systems out there that have been assembled or designed by different people and not one single individual really understands anymore what happens in each and every single part. Just take a modern microprocessor, no person really understands, not one single person understands what every transistor on that microprocessor is doing for individual functions, but it's complex systems that are assembled from complex systems doing pretty amazing things. So not everything we don't understand is AI, but then what is AI? Um, I wanted to kind of frame this again, creating these, com I'm trying to stay away from complex system because in, in computer science theory that has a slightly different connotation. I'm, but with, when I say complex systems, I just mean systems that do something where we think, how does it do that? And we don't really in, immediately understand the, the mechanics inside. So these systems are usually created, let's take one programmer or a team of programmers, let's stick with computer science setups here, could also be designers that are, or architects. <clears throat> They're building something, they may build a nine workflow, they may, may write a program that's doing something and this program is then taken and put into production somewhere. In a factory, it can also be a smart car or not so smart car, your espresso machine that's doing amazing things or your smart home that's in our case, at least, not doing so, so many smart things. Seems to be fairly dumb. But the point is, in this particular example, I have someone who creates a system that's solving a particular problem in reality, in real life. In contrast to that, an intelligence system creating artificial intelligence is something where that individual, or usually it's a team of individuals, are creating something. And this something, this system, usually a program, is then used to learn something from reality, right? So it's interacting in many cases when, when we talk about data science, it's interacting with data. <clears throat> and from this interaction, something is derived. And the something, I depicted it here as a little robot just to make it a little bit clearer. That's usually what you would call this artificial intelligence. This something is now being put in production, right? It's running and you're doing something strange in your car, in your coffee machine, in your rice cooker. Right. So this is fundamentally different. Why? Let's look at the three properties, right? Systems versus these intelligent systems, this AI stuff. Systems tend to, every part of that program was created by a human, right? It can be different humans working together in large teams, whatever. But at the end of the day, I can go back to every line of code, say this, ideally, if I have a good system that allows me to do that, I can go back and say this was written by Fritz. This was written by Jim. And I know who to blame for problems there, or maybe also praise for cool stuff being done there. The responsibility for the correctness or fairness or that it does the right thing, whatever that means, in the end lies with that creator, right? But Fritz, we told you you needed to write something that does this, this, and this. It's not doing that. So something between specification and what you implemented just doesn't work. So we can, at least in theory, verify that it's doing what we wanted it to do against the specification. Intelligent systems, on the other hand, the learning program was created by humans. So the algorithm, the method that looks at data and does something, it derives this the little robot that it, I depicted, the intelligent system. The method there that does that, that creates the system, was created by humans. The correctness and the fairness, or 
whatever else you're interested in making sure the system observes is the result not anymore of those people writing that, and I'll show you an example in a second, but it's really the result of choosing the right learning method and the proper data, right? And again, I'll show you in a second why that matters. Um, the problem there is we cannot verify correct function anymore. I mean, some of these learning systems produce something very trivial, just a linear regression or something. Of course, I can look at the parameters and then I know what it does and I can do some verification. But the, the, the interesting system is something like a deep, deep learning architecture. After I trained that, I cannot verify that this does something according to a specification. If I could, if I had that specification, I could have written this thing from the start, right? So all of these trends around explainable AI are, for at least complex intelligent systems, at best a crutch. You cannot explain what an artificially intelligent system does if it's complex enough, right? I mean, there's this disclaimer, because that's part of the point. If I could explain it, then I'd obviously had an easier representation that's a, that is explainable, then I can use that. So if, if somebody presents you an easy, understandable explanation for your super complex artificial system and says, it's doing exactly the same, then you should really ask back, why aren't we using the simple system then instead of this complex thingy that we had to train? So just a simple, simple example. So where do we assign fault? Let's assume we're training a robot arm to pick up objects, right? I just want them, the robot arm to take an object, move it from here to over there. So I'll present it with examples. That's how training works. Give it a couple of baseballs, which, by the way, is the most interesting sport anyway, but that's more of a personal note. Then we can present them tennis balls, which is Tom's most favorite sport, but nobody else cares. And I can present a bowling ball, right? Because I'm smart, I realize baseballs, tennis balls, same size. <laughs> I want this robot to learn to pick up objects of different size, right? So it figures that out as well. Works fine, doesn't, everything works, moves bowling balls, tennis balls, baseballs, like nothing. Now I presented with a new object, a little egg. And not surprisingly, I'm ending up with scrambled eggs. So what's the problem there? Who do I blame? Why did this egg break? Could be the creator of the learning method. The creator of the learning method is probably telling you, come on, guy, I mean, I gave you a robot that you can train to do certain movements, but do I care what things get moved from where to where? I mean, that's your job to make sure something else is better. You should have picked the better method. My method was unsuitable for that one. But the next one, there's tons of methods, but they're usually not written for picking up tennis balls, baseballs, eggs, or others, because if they were, we wouldn't train a system and it wasn't intelligent. The point of intelligent systems is that they generalize to other objects. So the only solution we still have is probably the provider of the data who screwed up, right? The data can be wrong, it can be biased, it can be incomplete. In this particular example, stupid example, it was clearly biased towards very strong objects, or it was definitely incomplete in terms of weak objects, right? The problem is, of course, that in many, many cases, in reality, it's not that easy to realize when data or methods are wrong, right? You're realizing much later that you're running this object, that when something strange happens that you just didn't think about to include that kind of a scenario, even a, it's a simple abstract scenario in your training that you oh man, we should have trained for that one as well, right? So suddenly, the, the responsibility from providing a, a specification and implementing as the spec, against the specification moves to making sure that you're training the system in an environment that actually is representative for what you want it to act in later, right? So AI in the real world is really something you want to govern it, you want to be able to control it, right? In many, some cases, maybe you don't care, so some egg breaks, but in most cases, these kind of disasters are a problem. So you need to always be able to afterwards explain which data was used for training, why was it huge, which model were we using, which parameters were chosen, why was that choice being made, right? So that afterwards you can at least, when something strange happens, go back and say, okay, we need to add this to the training data, or maybe we need to choose a different model um, different parameters after all. And we still, even after, let's assume we pick the right data, right method, and the model actually does really what we want it to do and will never be 100% sure for complex systems, we still need to make sure the model works with historical representative. Uh, suddenly, we're training a new model and does something completely weird on past data, not a good idea. We want to make sure it keeps working on new data, right? Reality changes. So we need to make sure that the model that we trained a year ago still works today, or we need to constantly update it, lots of other things there. It doesn't fail in critical test cases, but we want to make sure that, okay, for these types of eggs, we really don't want to break eggs, so no matter what we do, we're going to test for that explicitly. 
And of course, it may need to comply with changing standards. Some things what you consider not biased 20 years ago is biased or discriminating 20 years later. So maybe you need to adjust there as well. This sounds awfully familiar, right? Because in the end, it's, it's all of this stuff is something that's part of the data science life cycle. When we put data science production models into production, final data science models into production, we need to observe all of these types of things as well. We need to validate them. We need to make sure how to deploy them. We need to make sure we monitor and update all of that stuff. So AI, in our view, is a subset of the data science life cycle. That's an ingredient, all of those things. And it appears here, it's obviously on the blending, on the transformation side, there are really, really cool methods that automate, they learn that, they're automatically extracted from data and suggest a certain blending or transformation model. On the modeling side, clearly, obviously, that's where a lot of these AI models sit. Some for the visualization side, we also have AI methods that help pick specific visualizations. The optimization is clearly, it's one of the core areas where AI is applied as well. A lot of this validation, the deployment stuff, classic data science, in the end of the day, I need to take the AI model, continuously deploy it into production. And then we, of course, also see it a little bit here. Some of the interaction can be something where the, where the system keeps learning another application of AI. And on the updating side, we can also continuously update and learn new models. But it needs to be governed, right? We need to make sure that in production, we don't suddenly learn a system that has forgotten some of the past thingies. So maybe we need to do careful data sampling, lots of strategies that need to be deployed here as well. Um, so to me, the takeaway from these 10 minutes or so is really artificial intelligence is a part. It's a super important part of the data science life cycle. You need to be able to deploy AI models just like you can deploy other machine learning or statistical mo models. But for AI to be used in real life, I, need, I think it becomes even more important. We need to invest even more effort into make sure you completely document the learning environment as well. You need to be able to always go back and, and just explain this is how we derived this model. It was not intentional. We screwed up on the data or something happened or we picked the wrong method, but you need to be able to go back there, explain that, fine tune it, correct it. You need proper validation before moving into production, even more importantly for sophisticated AI models, because it's very, very simple to train a model so it suddenly develops a new bias, right? It's not like you keep adding rules to a rule-based system. You're actually training a model and the model gets deployed. So lots of um, governance strategies that needed here as well. And then, of course, all this ongoing monitoring validation during production almost is that more important than for other data science models? Probably not. I'd argue that's important anyway, right? You need to make sure that the data science model that you put in production, a production package, works, produces still the same results, works also under changing reality and under changing circumstances.